as I understand it, Amit Zappa came to you and said, I've got a, a germ of an idea. And you said, don't tell me anymore. I think I know where you're going with this. Tell me a little bit about how that meeting went and what his initial idea was. Well, it, it's a little more elaborate than that, but, but here's what happened. I uh, had sat up in bed a few nights before I met Amit and told my wife I want to make one of those movies. I'd been dreaming that I was directing something and it was going well. I want to make one of those movies like Field of Dreams, It's a Wonderful Life. She said, great. She went back to bed. And I said, she said, well, go back to bed. And I couldn't. And she said, what's the matter? And I said, I don't really come up with those ideas. Cut to, I'm meeting with uh, Scott Sanders and Amit Zappa. Scott had brought Amit to me. said, Amit has got something that I think you need to hear. He told me about a couple that couldn't have a kid. They, in the... Uh, in an, in an effort to get rid of their, uh, get through their grief, they buried their ideas for what their child would have been like and bury them in the ground, and that night it rains, and out comes a boy, and he has five leaves on each ankle. The qualities at that point were a little more general, and, you know, it, and from there, there was just a myriad of possibilities. And so when I heard what he told me, I began to tell them, uh, well, first of all, I started the meeting with, I'm not really interested in what you have to say, but let's, let's get to know each other. He told me that, and I started telling stories from my own experience as a parent, as a child, from other people I knew, what I'd kind of, all that I'd learned in the 15 years at that point that I'd been a dad. And, uh, and the meeting got very emotional. And um, uh, I really didn't want to write, you know, off of anyone else's notion or idea or story, but uh, this was too uh, delicious, and it felt like if I took Amit's magic and married it with my experience and my, you know, my just uh, kind of deep need to continue to explore in a new way the issues of family and how we love and how we treat each other and how we navigate this broken world, if I could put all that together, um, maybe I could get close to making that kind of film that I was dreaming about, one of those movies that you watch over and over again because they give you a sense of possibility. Well, I think this film, it definitely has that sort of sense of possibility, but there, there is a, a magic realism element to it as well, but that's not really the crux of the story. No. And I think uh, you have to approach, or maybe, okay, this is a question, do you, do you approach uh, a story like this, uh, and or how do you work the magic in while still having the story be believable and grounded in reality? Because if it isn't grounded in reality, people aren't going to buy into it at all. Right. Well, the... the Grounded in, the relata grounded in the relatable reality of our time uh, was very important to me because, uh, I, you know, I guess this begs the question, is magic possible? And if you ask anybody about the story of how they met the person they married or how they, you know, came into the world... You poke around in anybody's history long enough, there's something astonishing that occurred. An unlikely meeting of two people. Uh, you know, people's lives impacted by war or famine or unemployment or disease or, you know, a good friend of mine met his wife at his father's funeral, you know. Now, so what's my point? That the There were many challenges here, but one was that the, that the first of all, that we established and set the world in, we ground the story right from the beginning. And that the, the, the magic, what, what is the magic? What's the reason for the magic? And then I, I did, I looked at all those great films, Field of Dreams, why are they coming out of the field? I mean, on a certain level with this kind of film, you have to take a bit of a leap. But with almost any movie you watch now, you know, for any film, you, you, you take a bit of a leap. And, and I think that's the enchanting part of cinema. And it's why we go to the movies, why the screen's so big. It's because you go, okay, for a moment I'm going to suspend and I'm going to accept that this is possible. But within the rules of what's possible, you still have to be, you know, very, uh, practice a great fidelity and, and to remain true. So 
for me, uh, I did not want the story to be uh, dripping in magic. I wanted it to, I think it, it's like, the, for instance, in my personal life, the way I met my wife was magical. But not every day with my wife is magical. Most of it is, you know, day to day. I wouldn't call it drudgery, but it's the stuff of life. And, but the moment we met, there have been a couple of other moments where, you know, it's been fireworks and, and magic, and you can almost hear the orchestra playing under the, the moments. And you can, you know, picture the, the cameras filming it. But most of life isn't that. And so I liked the idea that out of their ache, their deep yearning for this child, this magical uh, act would occur, and they would be given this child. But then from there, it was, what do you do after the magic? Because most of life is, you know, that careful and sometimes sluggish uh, negotiation of, of the mundane, the the nine to five ness of life, the I must pay the rent and pay my bills ness of life, and all of that, you know, stirring and and that so that the magic that we can perpetuate, that we can have, you and I can have in our lives, is born out of what? Born out of how we interact, how we, uh, how. We, those moments when I'm open to being changed, being altered by you and you by me. When, you know, yes, there's fear and there's peril and, and, and panic about how are we going to, you know, get through each day. But there's also that possibility of, of uh, what other people can do and how they can impact us and change us. And in this case, how this boy who... You know, the parents believe that, you know, we, I think one of the narcissistic curses of the 21st century, particularly parents of any, with any kind of privilege or, you know, you know, means of any kind, that we, we see ourselves as having much more power and, and, um, than we actually do. That ultimately, um, so I thought to get to make a story that raises the questions, do children belong to us? Or do we belong to them? Um, you know, is my child's ultimate purpose to f heal my broken childhood, um, to fix the wounds that, you know, heal the wounds that are uh, left from, you know, the, you know, the generations that come before, or is actually my job to create an environment as best I can where they are able to become who they are destined to be? So it just was a great opportunity to explore uh, all the things that matter to me and um, but also you know have have some fun at uh, the expense of my many mistakes and 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 uh, to also uh, ennoble some of the uh, crimes that I've watched uh, my peers and my parents and me myself perpetuate. So, and I mean, I mean crimes, I mean, you know, I'm not talking about uh, felony, I'm talking about, you know, uh, misdemeanors of the, of the heart. Well, it's interesting because you, you say have some fun with it. The, the movie uh, is whimsical in a way, but it's also, it, it, it divides the whimsy up. In, in the, by that I mean, when you first discover that the town that they live in is sort of a, a factory town and it's all about making pencils. It's where uh, Joel Edgerton's character works, Jennifer Garner's character works in the Pencil Museum. It's a whimsical idea. It's a whimsical, and the, but then you realize there's real, there's serious trouble at, yes. the, at the pencil factory. And so you've taken the whimsy and sort of turned it on its head a little bit and brought it back more into reality. Same idea with Timothy Green, the character, the young boy. It's a whimsical idea that he could grow like a plant. But then he becomes a real flesh and blood uh, person and thing. So I like how this movie plays with ideas of of whimsy and 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 balance and, and finds that balance. As um, uh, when you were putting this together, just tell me about finding that balance. And and was there a moment that you sat back and said, okay, we pushed it too far one way or the other, or we have to we have to really 
uh, find the, exactly the right tone of this. Well, there was a moment when I realized we'd pushed it too far. We, they, the studio asked me to do a reading in October. We started filming in the end of January. And it was the day they greenlit the film. It's an official green light. It's a big moment, especially in this new climate where they're making fewer and fewer movies. So they called me and said, we're making your movie. And uh, that was between my rehearsal for the reading and then the reading. And we did the reading. And the reading uh, was going very well. And about halfway through, uh, the reading fell apart. The actors, all, all who were very good actors, some of them quite famous, were reading. And suddenly I found myself falling asleep. And, and uh, the room got very grim. And what I realized was that there were scenes that were very clever, but the story was episodic, and, it, and, and uh, everything wasn't hanging together. And Jim and Cindy felt like the same character. They, they didn't have, I hadn't individuated their journeys. And, you know, so characters like uh, Jim's father didn't exist at this point. And Rosemary DeWitt's character was two characters, which I combined. And I realized that while the journey was right, the ultimate journey, the middle of the movie was in deep trouble. And it, it I, I had more whimsy and I had less meaning. And so it was a constant process of trying to make the, the story uh, more uh, kind of Vivaldi-esque in its, in how it skipped. You know, I love, I always thought of musically Vivaldi, just the way that music is so beautiful, it's so massive, but it has a lightness. At the same time, it also knows, he, he knew when it, when it was time to matter and when everything needed to go. So it's about balance. And, uh, you, you know, for me, the films I love the most are ones that make me laugh until my stomach hurts because the humor is identifiable and human-based. And at the same time, those stories uh, just reach down into you and, you know, grab your heart. And those are the... We don't see many films like that. They're either very broad or they're very dramatic. Um, and it's not an easy kind of thing to balance. But that's how I experience the world. I find the world rather absurd and there's incredible beauty in the world, but there's also uh, a deep ache and, and a lot of fear. And, and I felt like for this movie to mean the most, it needed to cost the most to make. And we needed to bring the most uh, to it each day. And that's what we tried to do.